In his new book, Slow Burn, R. Jisung Park draws upon vast amounts of raw data and novel economics to show how the subtle but significant consequences of a hotter planet have already begun, from lower test scores to high crime rates, and how we might tackle them today. Park is assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds appointments in the School of Social Policy and Practice and the Wharton School of Business. An environmental and labor economist, he has been investigating and writing about the economics of climate change for more than a decade. He has advised organizations that range from the, free world, from the world Bank to, the, to New York City Departments of Education and Health. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with A. Patrick Barrer, Research Economist, Development Economics at the World Bank. Please welcome our guests. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, you ready? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. So I have some questions that Ji Sung and I will talk through, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So let's start just with some questions about the book itself, about the process, and then we'll get into the, the messages in the book. Sounds great. But you're an academic. Uh, the currency of academics is journal articles, not <laughs> yeah. necessarily books. So why a book? Why what prompted you to write the book? Great question, Patrick. So first of all, let me just say thank you for everyone for coming here um, to the Free Library for hosting this event. And thanks to you uh, for, for being my interlocutor. I just want to share a quick snippet about Patrick because it's relevant to this question. Um, in addition to being just a really good friend, Patrick and I have been uh, very close collaborators on academic research for, gosh, several, many years now. And much of the work that is highlighted in the book uh, would not have been possible were it not for our collaborations and also just the dozens if not hundreds of conversations that we have had on this topic. So it's doubly special for me uh, that he is, he is uh, my compatriot tonight. Um, why did I write the book? So you know this very well. Um, the academic literature on, let's call it, the economic impacts of climate change the empirical economic impacts of climate change has really exploded in the last decade and a half. Um, and it gives us a very, an increasingly nuanced understanding of the day-to-day -day implications of how climate change will affect us and, and is already affecting us uh, in our daily lives. That literature, which we sort of live and breathe every day as part of our, our jobs, uh, didn't seem to be as well reflected in the public discourse uh, about climate change. And so that's the fundamental, uh, the main reason why uh, I decided to write this book, because I truly believe that um, in a secular democracy, as the one we have here and many other countries, the main way we make lasting change on policy issues, especially ones like climate change that require coordination, is through democratic discourse as as dysfunctional as some of the you know system, uh, systems might seem and accurate information is just a critical input to that discourse and I just got the feeling that look uh, I could spend a little bit more time writing you know the 11th and 12th papers on this subject or I could try to synthesize both my own work and many others work in a way that was accessible uh, to people who don't have a PhD right in economics or statistics um, but who could really value, who, who could really benefit from, from the data. Um, so here we are. Fair enough. So uh, as you say, we've worked together on a lot of things. Um, we have a process for working on research, for doing analytical work, but I think the process of writing a book is very different from the process of writing a paper or doing statistical analysis. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your process, wh how you chose to work on the book, what you found that worked or didn't work in doing that synthesis that you talked about? Great question. Um, so first of all, hindsight is twenty twenty, <laughs> and I wish I had known some of the things that I know now about the process. Uh, it's also hard to disentangle the process that I engaged in from just the historical circumstances. So the idea of the book, the core idea of the book you know, has been in the recesses of my mind for many, many years, but it, the crystallization as a, oh, maybe we should do this as a real project, actually occurred a month before the COVID pandemic hit. 
Um, and so all of the things that I did to you know, reorient my life to be able to write the book um, also coincided with all of the things that we did to reorient our lives to make room for the pandemic and all of its after effects. It's hard to disentangle those two. Um, but to maybe use a metaphor that you've heard me use before, you know, with a lot of academic research, it, it often feels like you're, you're sort of at the frontier of the kingdom in the forest, like just hacking away at trees, and you don't really know where you are. It's like two steps forward, eight steps back. You know, it's a lot of, of messy work that has a lot of uncertainty about how things fit together. The book was really nice in that it was an opportunity to, again, to extend this metaphor, get out of the woods, go up to the highest tower of the castle and actually look at the landscape and take it all in um, from a bird's eye view and, and try to stitch together a coherent synthesis and a picture. So it, it required a different, uh, a different set of muscles than what, I t you know, what we normally um, are required to use. And also just from the standpoint of really trying to think carefully about what are the stories and the narrative devices that can be brought out to help make these points more digestible or hit home um, for someone who may not be inherently interested in climate change or economic inequality or any of the issues that uh, the book tries to tackle. Well, you said that hindsight's twenty twenty, uh, so I want you to reflect a little on, on what you went through while you were writing the book. Tell us what the best part of writing the book was, and also the worst part of, oh, of writing the book. Okay, I'll, I'll do it in the reverse order. The worst part is, the worst part was just that it was um, pretty lonely. You know, most of the research that I do is quite collaborative. You know, the book is sort of, it's all up here, uh, with, with a lot of support from my wife, essentially. Um, the best part is being able to share it with, with everyone in my life and all of you. Um, these ideas that, uh, again, have been so front of mind. Um, let me put it a different way. The best part is to see the product of the many hundreds of pages of notes that were eventually not used become sort of filtered into an, an, an essence that is presentable and hopefully you can be the judge readable uh, and digestible in, in one kind of um, coherent piece because it draws from a very wide range of, um, I guess, areas of study within our field. And it tries to bring together a couple of different sort of themes um, that before I wrote the book, I, I would not have guessed would have ended up being in the book. Um, for instance, you know, um, not just the nuts and bolts of how climate change affects us, but the psychology around how we think about problems that are maybe important for society in an aggregate sense, but not as salient to us in a day-to-day -day sense. Uh, and just really thinking about what that means for, you know, um, both our individual understanding of an issue, but also how we collectively act on it. Like those are the kinds of themes that I didn't really think were going to be so central before I wrote it, but it's kind of cool to see uh, reflected in, in the finished product. Well, so my, my next question kind of expands on that. Um, the book covers a wide variety of, of topics, as you say, that sort of extend beyond areas that we've worked on that you've worked on in the past. Sure. Um, so what was the most interesting thing that you learned while doing the research for the book, whether it made it into the book or not? Mm. Sort of what did you learn about either yourself or about climate change that you hadn't known before? Yeah, well, so maybe I'll start, I'll answer that question by telling all of you a little bit more about some of the things that I try to address in the book. Don't mainly. say too much. Okay, I won't say too much. <laughs> all right, <laughs> right. Um, but one of the... One of the major themes of the book is that, you know, climate change is already hurting us, but in ways that um, 
may not necessarily be covered as frequently or as intensely in the news or may not be as salient to us psychologically um, because of the way, again, that they're either hidden or diffuse across many, um, many people or many interactions. So just to give you one example, actually, that is, is more relevant to your own research, it turns out that you know, as deadly as the wildfires that we've seen in, well, in the Western United States and Canada last year are for the direct, um, the direct inhabitants of, of, the, of the areas right, right around the flames, it actually turns out that when you, when you look at the data, the human health costs associated with the wildfire smoke that blows down wind may be an order of magnitude, if not perhaps multiple orders of magnitude larger than the number of people who die in the wildfires themselves. That's something that I didn't fully appreciate before I started doing the research for the book. But it's, it's also just, I think that example is a metaphor for the kinds of subtle impacts of climate change that are not, um, that are easy to miss and hard to appreciate without the benefit of the kind of big data and analytical tools that um, you know, have, come to, have come to light in the past few decades on this issue. And so, yeah, that, that's, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that, that's sort of one of the main nuggets of the book that, again, I think intuitively I knew was going to be important. In retrospect, it seems more important uh, that it was included. But while, while looking into the many dozens of papers that have come out on this topic, um, it became increasingly clear that actually this, is, this, this theme is much broader than the few papers we've written together, right, or, or the few ob observations that I've made uh, before, just because it, it, and it's more important because it really, I think, underscores um, the need for us to have multiple mental models for thinking about climate change, not just the sort of climate catastrophe insurance framework that I'm sure many of us are familiar with and I'm sure we can get into if we have time. I was going to say, so tell us a little bit more about that, the climate catastrophe framework. The book sort of doesn't say that that's wrong necessarily, right. but uh, encourages us to think about climate change in a very different way than it's typically covered in the media. So yes. why that particular treatment of climate change? Why do you think that focusing on these other dimensions is perhaps more important than the catastrophe dimension? Right. I'm going to go ahead and guess that if you're in the audience now, you've come because you have at least some curiosity about climate change. And I'm going to guess also uh, that you're familiar with you know, someone like Greta Thunberg, right? Or, or just this notion of um, climate change as a crisis, right? A potentially civilization ending crisis. In fact, a few years ago, you know, many British newspapers actually made a editorial decision to get rid of the term climate change and replace it with climate crisis. The book is not saying that that was a problem per se, um, but it's taking, it's encouraging us to add to that way of thinking about climate change an additional mental heuristic. So let me sort of uh, expand on the first heuristic a little bit first. So personally, and I, th I'm, I think you'll agree too, it probably makes a lot of sense to uh, think about climate change and acting on climate change as a sort of catastrophe insurance, right? So we take out insurance on low and, and very uncertain risk, high potential damage um, events all the time, right? If you take out life insurance, home insurance, right? So there's a sense in which because of all of the uncertainty involved with projecting out what the climate will look like in 50 to 100 to 200 years, and all of the multiple complexities associated with you know, uh, potential tipping points in the climate system, it makes a lot of sense to invest heavily in reducing CO2 emissions as a form of catastrophe insurance. So in that, it, it, along those lines, I think it made a lot of sense for the Greta Thunbergs of the world and many climate activists to sort of jolt us out of our complacency. It's like, look, this really could be a civilization ending problem. We should act on it urgently now. 
And I think in part because that framework has been, I would argue, moderately successful at mobilizing action, that's another thing that I think the media conversation misses is how much progress there's actually been. I think it makes it even more important that we're able to think about climate change additionally, not as, not, um, uh, as a substitute for this way of thinking, but in addition, as more of a dial, not a switch. So in other words, to think about what incremental, even non-catastrophic warming means in terms of the damages that it perpetuates to society, whether it's in terms of lives lost, learning inhibited, productivity lost, uh, what have you, and to be able to have a much more nuanced understanding of what is the difference between living in a plus 1.5 degrees Celsius world and a point plus 1.8 degree world, a plus 2 degree world. These incremental differences, the data actually suggests, matter a lot. These are billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars of difference in terms of the damages to society. But I think the book is trying to make the claim that especially as we become more successful at potentially at averting truly catastrophic climate change, which I, um, the data that I'm familiar with suggests that we, we are on our way to doing that, it probably is more, it, it becomes more and more important that we understand, well, why is it that we need to continue abating emissions, right, and to sustain this costly effort um, in addition to having this catastrophe insurance? Why is it that we need to, that we want to shoot for, right, 1.8 degrees as opposed to 2.2 degrees or 3 degrees Celsius? That's the kind of empirical sense of what climate change means uh, that I'm after in the book. So you've talked a lot about the damages, about why this sort of different approach to thinking about the damages instead of thinking about catastrophe, but thinking about insurance matters. There's a whole other dimension to the book, which is about inequality and who is going to be impacted by yep. these damages. So talk a little bit about that. Is it is it we've heard a lot, I think, anyone who pays attention to climate change in the media about how it's going to impact low income countries. I work at the World Bank. We're very concerned about how it's going to impact countries outside of the United States. But is that the the only or the most important dimension of inequality in the effects of climate change, or are there others? Great question. And here too. Um, what I try to do in the book is, so the answer is yes and no. I think all of us are familiar with this idea that climate change is a problem that is, for the most part, caused by um, developed countries in the global north, and the effects of which are likely to be uh, felt more, most severely by the, quote, global south, the developing countries. To a first order, I think that is the most important dimension climate inequality. Um, if you just look at, there are a few figures in the book where, you know, if you look at what a 1.5 degree or 2 degree average warming world does to the number of, let's call them dangerously hot days, for a place like New York, we're talking about maybe uh, two to three more weeks a year where temperatures are going to be above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. For the same average warming, for a place like Bangkok, Thailand, we're talking about up to 100 additional days per year above 90 degrees Fahrenheit from the same you know, 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius average warming scenario. So, there, so absolutely, there is a sense in which um, you know, the rich country, poor country divide that climate change exacerbates is, is probably you know, the, one of the most, if not most, the most important dimension of how climate change affects, uh, interacts with inequality. But in the book, I try to um, make the case that we may also want to care about how climate change interacts with not international inequality so much as interpersonal inequality. So the inequality in economic wherewithal um, across individuals within a given country, for instance, given the fact that climate change is happening amid a backdrop of persistently high, if not rapidly rising, interpersonal inequality in many parts of the world. So in the US, for reasons that we can get into if we have time, you know, the earnings gap between workers with at least a bachelor's degree or a professional degree 
and workers without a bachelor's degree has just continued to rise and rise and rise over the last four or five decades. You know, there is a voluminous economic literature that documents the causes of those trends, whether it's globalization or autom automation and skill-based technical change or something else. But the interesting thing is, these trends are not unique to the US. So the magnitude of this divergence uh, seems to vary, but the overall direction of the change is quite uniform across many OECD countries. And even in China, um, according to recent analysis by Thomas Piketty and others, as of you know, 2015, the top 1% of Chinese income earners, mostly the urban elites in Shanghai and Beijing and where, where else, they earn roughly as much as the bottom 50%, right? The hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions, sorry, of, of, of mostly rural Chinese citizens. That is, not, that is a relatively new phenomenon, but those trends are trends that I, I argue in the book are very important to understand, not only understand the causes of, but understand deeply the interactions of with a changing climate. Um, in part because it informs our understanding of how bad of a problem climate change is, but also because, and maybe we'll get to this, um, it may be really important as countries and local governments begin to grapple with the reality that we, we're also going to have to help need to help communities adapt to the warming that is already occurring uh, and that will be baked into the system no matter what we do. And so, yeah, that, that's a dimension of, of climate change and economic inequality that um, the book encourages us to think about more, more deeply. Fair enough. And so that leads into the, the next set of questions. We've talked a lot about, or you've talked a lot about how climate change is sort of happening. The damages are happening. We, in fact, all of the work that the book is based on is sort of backwards looking that's true. work that's documented. These are, are things that climate change has done in the past. In the conversation so far, it sort of seems as though climate change is fait accompli. It's going to happen, yeah. and the damages are going to happen. Is that fair? Can we sort of avert disaster? Can we avert these many small damages that, that come with climate change? Is this another book about we're all doomed, but just in a different way? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, answer is the, the answer is no, it's not that book. Uh, yes, I think we can avert. In fact, let me take a step back. Um, I am not a psychologist, but to be an armchair psychologist, I, I personally think, and I hope you will agree, that it is important to have a positive sense of agency around any problem whether it's a personal problem or a societal problem. And so I think it's very important that um, the public continues, continues to have access to facts that allow us to have a positive sense of agency around the issue of climate change. That is one of the intentions of the book because while it is true <laughs> that there's a lot of bad news first, um, climate change is hurting us already in these subtle ways that add up in ways that you, we might not have uh, appreciated as much before. It is also true because of, well, it is also true that the actions that we take today to reduce emissions have measurable positive impacts on the quality of life of ourselves in the future, our children and our grandchildren. And because we're able to better document the incremental costs of warming, that also means that we're better able to document the incremental benefits of doing something about it. And the short way to answer your question is, yes, there is some amount of climate change that is baked into the Earth system that even if we were to reduce emissions to zero today, you know, there would be a few decades worth of climate change um, that is inevitable. But what happens, you know, after that in the 20, 50, 60, 70, and on horizon, very much up to what we do today. Um, and again, here too, just getting back to my earlier point about, hopefully it doesn't seem like a blithely optimistic point. I truly am optimistic in the sense that just 10 years ago, the median projections for how much warming we would experience were somewhere between three degrees and five degrees Celsius by the end of the century. That's a lot of warming. That's potentially, you know, truly catastrophic. Um, uh, as of recently, those projections are down to something more like 1.8 to 
to three degrees Celsius. That's still an uncomfortably, you know, high and large range, uh, but that's significant progress. And to the extent that we're able to continue mobilizing, you know, uh, effort, in including in the United States, right? Just last year, we actually, it kind of flew under the radar, <laughs> but the biggest climate bill in US history, I think that's a fair statement, uh, was just passed, you know, uh, a little over a year ago. It doesn't get us all the way, but it gets us maybe 40 to 50% of the way. And so, you know, the more we can build on that kind of progress, um, yeah, we, I think we absolutely have a chance to, to avert climate disaster and reduce these damages. So maybe to put a little finer point on it. Um, I'm actually curious what you think, actually. I'm quite optimistic. But yeah, okay. Uh, in my day job, I'm at the World Bank. I also teach undergraduates in the evenings, and I've had several students, in my, so I teach a class on climate economics. Several college students say to me, I don't think I want to have kids yeah. because I'm concerned about climate change. So you just said that you're, you're optimistic, I'm optimistic, you think that we can avert these, these damages, but what would you say to those students? Um, I'm tempted to do a poll of whether you've, if that thought has crossed your mind as well, um, but I won't. <laughs> Let me give you a statistic that scares me, actually. Uh, there was a survey done of young people, 16 to 25 year olds, in 10 different countries, the US, UK, Brazil, India, Nigeria, several others. And I think something like 45% of young people who responded to the survey um, responded as having been so anxious about climate change that it affected their day-to-day -day lives in a negative way uh, consistently. <laughs> I've had people very close to me ask that same question, like, should, we have, should I have kids? you know, in, a, in, this, in this environment. Whether you should have children or not is obviously a very personal decision, but um, my read of the evidence is that while climate change is likely to reduce our quality of life substantially, um, I don't, I, 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 I do really think that the common media portrayal of, you know, catastrophe, doom and gloom has maybe gone a little bit overboard among our, young, our younger generation because, um, I might be curious to hear what you think, Patrick, but the, my, my read of the evidence is that that should not be a major reason why you don't have kids if you want to have kids because um, while it is true that it will, you know, it will adversely affect our quality of life again in, in, in significant ways, uh, it, it doesn't seem like enough of a step change from the status quo that it should inhibit one. I, I, to, to me, it sounds a little bit more like projecting the anxiety combined with uncertainty about what this all means uh, into this issue of having kids rather than, you know, a, a clairvoyant assessment of, of what it would actually mean to have kids in, in this world. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I agree with you. As you know, I have an 11-month-old daughter, so. Yeah, <laughs> revealed preference. Revealed preference. So you said that this book, one of the, the best things about writing the book was seeing the, the process of hundreds of pages of notes come sort of get sh winnowed down into the, the final product. That means a lot of things got left out kind of yes. inevitably in a book like this. What's one, what was maybe the last thing that oh you wow. left out? What was the thing that you wish you could have included in the book but had to get cut? Hmm. I wish I had had both more time and more room to more thoroughly research and more deeply interrogate in the book um, the potential impacts on non-human actors on biodiversity, on you know, ecosystems at writ large. That is not my area per se, and I, and I toyed with the idea of learning more about it to include it in the book. There's a little bit of it at, in the final chapter on coral reefs, but it's just a taste of what I know to be a really large literature. Um, and just as a human being who grew up a child of the great outdoors and, and still really loves spending you know, as much of my free time as I can in nature, 
one of the things that does make me very sad about climate change is what it will do to non-human sentient beings, to other species and to biodiversity. Um, so that's something that I wish I could have, you know, that wish there could be more of in the book. Um, but lest I leave all of us with, with a more, you know, more doomsday mm -hmm. sense, uh, even there, the literature appears to suggest that there are many things that we can do to help ecosystems, animals, coral reefs be more resilient to the climate change that we are inevitably going to experience. So again, it's always this one-two punch of aggressively mitigating so that climate change slows down and eventually stops, while also helping communities, and communities can be defined as local human communities, but it can also be defined to include non-human communities, adapt to the warming that is happening. Um, I think that really is a case for optimism because, the, again, the data suggests that, you know, there is a lot of potential for successful adaptation to really blunt the, uh, the damages associated with any given amount, um, with, a, with a given amount of, of climate change. Always about climate change, anything about it, 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 it the, no one ever speaks about what happens to our bodies, to human bodies, specifically skin. Hmm. Skin protects our body, and it's the largest organ, I think, of our body. So all these things are going to happen. What about our skin? That is a great question. I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> as, as someone who does not have an MD, I can't say for sure about the physiology. I can say that irrespective of the specific biological mechanism through which heat or other climate change hazards may affect our health, it is absolutely true and, and shown in many, many studies that the physical hazards of climate change, extreme heat, wildfire smoke, just to name a few of many, uh, will adversely affect our health directly, if that's what you're getting at. I don't know about whether climate change per se will affect, you know, the like skin per se, but I'm, I'm sure there are, um, maybe there are doctors in the room that can tell us, uh, but I do know for a fact that, you know, the, the effects of climate change on health as an outcome are very well uh, substantiated and quite severe. You know, you, you talk about the parts of the globe that have been unduly affected by climate change. These countries were eager to adopt the Western style of life. True? I would say so. Okay. I mean, if you go to some of these countries now, they all have their automobiles, they have movie theaters, they have all the things that look good to them, you know, and they wanted, and they got. I'm not so sure it's fair to uh, use that, um, how should I say, to, to um, make the, the Western countries the villains in all of this. So yeah, I appreciate that comment, yeah. uh, and I and I. I think there is you know, potential intele intellectual merit to the idea that, um, you know, while it is well, let me just say some facts. Fact is, on a per capita basis. Western developed countries like the United States, emit, way more per person. Than any of these, you know the Indias or Chinas of the world. So yeah, they have cars and refrigerators, but we have just way more cars and refrigerators and we take more flights. And um, I think it, the case could be made that, you know, 
some of what the Western world was able to do through its economic growth was to develop technologies like better solar and better wind and right. And yeah, I mean, to the extent that some of the developed country, developing countries of the world will benefit from that, yeah, you can make a case that you know these are, are shared gains. But ultimately, sir, I think I think it kind of comes down to. Um, I think there can be a pluralism of, of values around how to interpret these unequal um, uh, contributions and unequal damages. And so I, I, I fully hear where you're coming from. Um, I just personally tend to disagree. Okay. Hello. Um, one question I have, uh, having had the opportunity to read some of this book, um, and I'm very excited to, to have it in hard copy now. Um, Thank you. What was it like to balance uh, a lot of the data-driven evidence um, along with narrative? Um, you know, we spoke today about um, a lot of the climate anxiety um, and, and how a lot of empirical data shows that maybe we don't need to be quite so anxious and right. have some positive agency. What was it like as a writer to balance the narrative uh, with with the data? Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. Um, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of internal anxiety as well, in part because, Patrick may laugh at this, you know, within sort of empirical research communities, um, we're, uh, thinking in or justifying actions based on anecdotes alone very much frowned upon because, you know, it's not rigorous. Um, and it's not the scientific method. However, evolutionarily, I believe human beings, we've evolved to think in stories, and so it, it seems also important to recognize that reality, and part of the motivation of the book is, was to you know, tell the story of the rigorous data in such a way that hopefully um, it can make more sense and, and, and be more memorable. Um, I think there's a passage in the book where I say something like, you know, uh, I this book isn't, is, is short on equations and long on stories for exactly that reason. Um, but yeah, it wasn't something that I was trained in, so you can be the judge of whether it was successful. <laughs> I just wanted to comment really more than question um, that as I sit here as a, a concerned citizen, um, someone who I consider to be, you know, reasonably as a, as a lay person informed about climate change. Um, you know, I always think, wait, wait a minute, hasn't this been settled for the last 30 years? You know, <laughs> 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 wasn't it like 40, 40, 50 years ago when they, but anyway, um, so that leads me to the comment, um, or maybe sort of a broad question, which is, okay, I'm a concerned citizen, I'm reasonably well informed, but what, what do I do? Um, and I know you don't have an answer. <laughs> Your work is, uh, both of you, is, is part of an ongoing process. And as a concerned citizen, I suppose I just have to sort of stay aware of what political positions are people are taking in reference to uh, climate change. So I do that as a voter, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But what the, the question which the gentleman here um, also raised, it's just such an incredible conundrum of um, different levels. Yeah. Uh, going, I mean, this, this, you know, I think about it and I say, yeah, uh, here we are. We're facing a problem where actually um, it has to be solved on a global level or it doesn't get solved. 100%. Um, and what the gentleman raised is, that, and you also mentioned at the beginning of your presentation about the psychology. Yeah. Um, well, certainly I'll say for, you know, for, for all of the academics, yeah, go to it. <laughs> you know, get a little deeper on what's going on, what will have to go on, because, um, you know, his comment raised the question, well, you know, if you're looking at something where uh, obviously people have to make, I don't know, in a way it sacrifices, even if it just means changing your daily habits, it's a sacrifice, it's a change, it's not business as usual. And when you get into these questions of, okay, people have to make, you know, a contribution or a sacrifice, um, so, um, yeah, you come back to the old uh, human nature of, well, yeah. why, why should I be doing this? The other person isn't doing so much, and, you know, don't blame me. What about you? Yeah. So the psychology, you know, if anything's really going to get done, 
um, the psychology is incredibly important because we've got the technical knowledge. I mean, right. it gets better and better all the time, and the technical advances are just mind-boggling. I mean, I, I don't have to say what, what did solar panels cost or look like in terms of efficiency 20 years Is ago. <laughs> no, it's just, sorry about that. Okay, just a comment, thank you. Oh, I appreciate the comment, thank you. And, and it brings up a really important point that we didn't talk about, which is that fundamentally, climate change is a global public good problem that will not be solved without global coordination. And probably one of the main reasons why it's been 30 years since we've known about the problem and it's taken so long. But again, even there though, you know, unless we have an informed citizenry like yourself pushing against misinformation and then pushing the, the representative govern, gov the, the individuals in government who represent our voices, pushing them to continue to make this an issue that is legislated at national levels so that the international coordination can happen and negotiation can happen more fluidly, um, these are necessary but not sufficient conditions, I'll just put it that way. On our way here, my friend and I were worried we were going to leave more doom and gloom. So it's really nice to hear <laughs> that you both share an optimism about this. And um, I guess my question really is um, translating what you know. I mean, you're really elbow deep, knee deep in this data with all this knowledge, and you have optimism. So you know, you were talking about having an, a, um, a less than one year old, I have a five year old, and w the kids are gonna learn in the media about the you know catastrophizing and all of that, but what would you say to kids, and it doesn't have to be as young as five, obviously, maybe a little older, that are getting one, one message from the media and, and, and how would you convey your optimism and, and how would you say that you know, to that generation or even someone in their 20s? Thank you for that question. Well, you're the only parent between the two of us, so I'll let you take a first crack at that. I thankfully have not had to think too hard about that she because doesn't that she doesn't yet. talk yeah. that much yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's your response? Okay. So just to answer your question very briefly, ma'am. Um, I would just emphasize the fact that this is a problem that's not going away and that it's not something that we are ever going to solve with a, like an on-off switch, yes, done. Like. So the more we continue to educate ourselves about the particulars of the issue, um, again, not only in terms of how bad of a problem is it and how, how, do we, you know, how quickly should we mitigate, but also in terms of how we may help certainly the most vulnerable among us, whether that's in a different country or in our, you know, in our own community, adapt to the warming that is inevitable to give that sense of optimism that, yeah, we are on the right track, but in the meantime, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to help communities adapt, and a lot of that work is actually very local. Um, I think that would be something that I would say to, to younger people because that will be the challenge that, that will, I think, um, be be relevant for, for mo much of their lives. Yeah. Let me add to more seriously, as Ji Sung said, we have made a lot of progress. Um, the warming that we should expect based off of policy has declined substantially relative to say even 2015. And in terms of the actual effects of climate change, so take heat has a negative effect on mortality for example. In the United States, we've nearly reduced that effect to to zero, sort of to a first order, by changing the way buildings are constructed, by installing AC, by providing better access to healthcare. So these are things that, that we can solve, that's sort of the root of our optimism, but more than that, they're things that, to some extent, we have already begun to solve. And so I think that emphasizing the places where we've had success is one way to convey that optimism. Mm -hmm. I. I've been involved with uh, the environmental movement for a little while, and one of the problems I find in talking to my friends and neighbors is that people are either strongly involved in the movement or they're not. And when I talk to many of my friends and neighbors, they, they will 
say, oh, I'm too busy. Oh, I've got this other interest. Um, I'm in this club or I'm, you know, I'm doing this hobby. Um, and when we look at the uh, priorities of voters, climate change is not up there among the top three or five. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on how to broaden out uh, the concern and the actions yeah. on to a greater percentage of the population. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I'm an academic, not an activist, but I can say that, you know, to the extent that one can have a theory of change in mind when writing a book like this, one aspect of it is that um, by highlighting the ways in which climate change is not just an environmental problem, it's actually a public health problem, it's a labor problem. I have this, you know, this whole chapter on, you know, how climate change affects work and labor productivity. Um, it, you know, is obviously a transportation infrastructure problem. So I think you can, again, I, I don't want to wade outside of my comfort zone, but to the extent that you believe that um, people can be motivated first and foremost by a different set of issues, but connecting climate change to the issue that is most front of mind and heart for a, a different set of groups, maybe one strategy um, that the data actually supports now answers your question. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, secondly, you mentioned that when you talk to younger people, I think you specifically said 14 to 25. Yes. I'm a little bit past that prime now. <laughs> that being said, my concern about climate change has affected my day-to-day -day life, and I don't have nearly as much data to hand as you do. Have you noticed that it's affected your day-to-day -day life, or is it more something that affects your voting and mm. the broader scope of your life? I uh, appreciate the question. Can I just ask to clarify, do you mean day-to-day -day life in terms of how I perceive climate change and how that affects my level of anxiety or frustration? Or More to the effect of like, I know I personally, I don't buy things that come in plastic uh, packaging it. if I can help it. I recycle, I compost, that kind of thing. Thank you. Um, wow, I'm, temp I'm trying to be disciplined because there's a lot that could be said. Um, since you have two economists on stage, I think, it, I think we need to, it is important to, to note um, or not pass up the opportunity to say that in an economist's ideal world, we would have national policy in such a way where you have a price on carbon that was commensurate with the damage being done to the environment. It could be through a carbon tax, it could be through something else. But such that even if not everyone was as mindful as you in each decision that we make, paper or plastic, should I take a Uber or a train? Should I buy an electric vehicle or a hybrid or something else? Even if we weren't being so deeply mindful of the environment in all of those decisions, that the price signals that are embedded in the structure of the economy would nudge all of us to make the right decision, that would be the economist dream, part of the economist dream solution, in part because of the difficulty of getting everyone on board on the same set of values and urgency about those values. So I just needed to get that off my chest. Um, that being said, yeah, it affects my actions. Um, it actually, I mean, f first it affects me personally in terms of how anxious I get about, you know, the, the phenomenon that, uh, that I observe, especially if people aren't taking it as seriously. So it's gotten better, but the way people respond to wildfire smoke has always been a little bit um, scary to me because, you know, you know when, we, when my wife and I were living in Los Angeles, um, there were many days where the wildfires had been uh, kept under control enough so that the flames weren't immediately damaging uh, or, or threatening, but there was a lot of smoke in the air, but we were just going about our day-to-day -day as if nothing was wrong, and there are clear negative consequences of that that are hidden to us, not immediately obvious to us, uh, in terms of health and what have you. Um, but yeah, again, uh, I, I don't, let me be cautious, I don't necessarily judge harshly 
others around me for not feeling the same sense of urgency in in the day-to-day purchasing or you know decisions that we make about our our individual lives um, because I kind of feel uh, I, I feel a bit of guilt and sorrow that we don't have something like a price on carbon that would make it easier for everyone. Um, but I don't know if that answers your question. It, it certainly does affect the day-to-day um, for me and, and, and those around me. So I'm curious, you mentioned um, in your talk that 1.8 was a goal above pre-industrial warming. Um, is that a new goal that scientists and economists are looking at uh, 1.8 versus 1.5 or 2 degrees? Uh, great question. Sorry if I, I misspoke. Uh, to clarify, it's not a new goal. It's just part of a new range of projections as to where we might end up if we keep going the way we're going. Yeah. Um, but that's also a range that has a lot of uncertainty uh, around it. So I read in the news probably about a month ago something that was shocking, which is that the projections for energy use that we used to have are all out of date because um, AI, cryptocurrency, and um, cloud uh, computing are shooting that graph way up beyond what we expected. So if we're talking about climate change, us individually, you know, uh, turning off the lights is not going to help very much. It requires something like super, super drastic that we would never consider because of the power and the profit behind it. What if we all just stop using computers? Wouldn't that absolutely solve the climate problem? So, like, how do you how do you balance something like that? It's not it's not us, you know, composting or not. It's yeah all the data processing that we are increasing and increasing and increasing. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm not familiar with that speci- you know, the specific numbers behind you know, the, the proportion of energy use that comes from AI and data processing. I'm sure it's a, a non-trivial proportion and it's growing rapidly. But I'll just come back to two points and I'll be quick. Um, one is I think that underscores the need for more than individual actions but collective government policies at the national, state, international levels. Because many of these are structural things that individuals, we cannot change. Like regardless of what the end use is, where that electricity comes from, how many power plants have you built in your life? I haven't built any, right? But that's a collective decision that we make. What kind of fuel those power plants use, those are policy-led decisions. So that, again, kind of comes back to the earlier point of informed citizens pushing lawmakers to make the right choice. But the other thing I'd I'd, I'd encourage us to think about is that, you know, there is a cost benefit in the sense that there's a reason why even if everyone in the world uh, wanted to act swiftly on climate change, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to shut everything down immediately in order to stop emissions and Precisely because, imagine if we, if we stopped using computers tomorrow, many of us probably can't get home because you, <laughs> if you took an Uber here, that's a computer doing. So what I'm saying is there's a transition dynamic and that's going to take a while, which one underscores the need to get, on our, get our act together quickly, but also to again be informed about how different policy choices affect that transition dynamic. Um, because some of those things aren't as obvious as, as they may seem. Thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That's all we have. <laughs>